Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the Road to Reformation Part 3 in our continuing study of a history of Christianity. In our timeline, notice we've looked at pre-reformers like John Wycliffe, uh, John Huss. Uh, we've seen the invention of the printing press that is going to uh, make it possible to, to write something and have hundreds of copies printed without the printing press. You never would have heard of Martin Luther. The fall of Constantinople in the year 1453 uh, was a big impetus on world events because now you're going to see the Muslims moving uh, into Central Europe and against Central Europe. Now, I want to make a distinction among the common people between the act of faith versus the content of faith. You have the term uh, fides qua, faith in uh, the faith with which you believe, versus the fides qua, the faith that is believed. Notice one is just talking about the faith that you have, and the other is the, the faith that has content. Um, on the one hand, the act of faith, that's trusting in Christ as your Lord, and Savior, but it's also understanding the specific content of your faith, um, and I believe there is a place for that, that, that it is important. Um, the act of faith is implicit faith. The content faith is explicit. It's what's on the outside, what is voice. The act of faith is what most people had in the medieval world. Um, the content of faith was usually reserved only for the theologians, especially in the West. Now, the hierarchical structure of the church was such that you had the Pope, and then, of course, there were cardinals. I don't actually show them. Uh, the bishops, and then under them, you had both what was called the secular clergy as well as the regular clergy. The secular clergy, those are the priests. Uh, and then you have the monks, remember the monasteries. Um, and some of these were contemplative orders, and then some were mendicant orders. Remember the contemplative orders, uh, they would be there to spend long periods in prayer and in meditation. Uh, they would be within the monasteries. The mendicant orders were more the begging orders. They were out among the people. They had to be there if they were going to beg. You also have by this time a liturgical calendar that has grown up. The monasteries, of course, would have regular times of prayer, but then the week was focused on Sunday. Uh, so every every week you have that special day. You also have a liturgical year. Um, there were special days like Christmas and Lent, the time leading up to the, the uh, remembrance of how Christ had died. Good Friday. Uh, the culmination of Lent, uh, the celebration of Easter, very known to most Christians even today. Pentecost was an important uh, time for the church uh, where they would actually remember it. it. You had Christmas and you had Easter and you had Pentecost, perhaps the three most observed, uh, or, or I should, should say the three most observed, the three most important uh, festivals and remembrances of the church. But then there were other special days as well, that had grown up all throughout the year. When we get to the Fourth Lateran Council, 1215, we have by this time seven sacraments. Uh, initially, you had just baptism and the Eucharist. Remember, the Eucharist is another term for the Lord's Supper. Uh, you have those in the, in the Bible itself and very early in the church. You can see those recognized, but added to those had been the ideas of penance, doing something uh, for the forgiveness of sins, a confirmation. Um, this was a time uh, where you would take a child who presumably had already been baptized into the church at a very young age, grown up in the faith, but now they had some sort of event where he would be confirmed in the faith into which he had earlier been baptized. So, confirmation. Uh, matrimony, uh, marriage was something you see all throughout Old and New Testament, but by now it had taken on the role of a sacrament. 
extreme unction, this uh, this final assurance at forgive, uh, of forgiveness and confession as one lay upon their deathbed, and then holy orders. Again, you see the idea of, for example, uh, elders and deacons and those that were t- uh, that were taking uh, these positions in the church, but now it had come to assume the role of a sacrament, something that bestowed grace. You also have the church calling for acts of mercy, of such as feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, visiting the sick, clothing the naked, visiting the imprisoned, accommodating the homeless, burial of the dead, all good things. Now, some are more in need today than others, but all good things for which Christians can be involved. Another doctrine that had risen up over the years was the doctrine of purgatory. You had, by the 3rd century, uh, prayers for the dead. There's actually a reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29, where Paul, uh, he's not really talking about that. He's, he's speaking in the context of resurrection, how we know there's a resurrection. And in passing, he has a one-verse comment, uh, why then are prayers made for the dead if there's no resurrection? Uh, and of course, in context, he's talking about those who are who are actually being put to death, dying because of their faith, persecutions. Um, and so I'm not sure that, that his reference to prayers for the dead means the same thing as what uh, was taking place in the third century. However, that's the biblical, that's the one biblical reference uh, that's made there. Now, a, a number of arguments had made against soul sleep, the idea that that you die and then you wake up uh, in heaven with the Lord. Um, Tertullian had argued that souls would pay the last cent. He's taking that from Matthew 5, 26 and uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 50. And, and certainly we don't want to negate anything that Jesus or the scriptures uh, say about that, that there is a, a, a final judgment. Um, martyrs were thought to enter right into glory without going through uh, any intermediate uh, state. Gregory of Nyssa taught that after death, souls could be purged by a what he called a purifying fire. I'm not sure exactly what he meant by that. Augustine cited 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, about a man being saved as through fire. And, and again, he, he, he said, you know, what, what does that look like and what does that, what does that mean? Now, the idea that purgatory is an intermediate place came about much later in the 1100s, in the late 1100s. Uh, Aquinas cited 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verse 46 as proof of purgatory, um, where it says uh, it's, it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from sins. Um, and I think that um, the books of Maccabees are good for history, I'm not sure that I would take my theology from them. It was given status of a church doctrine in the First Council of Lyon. This is 1245. So, so the doctrine of purgatory comes very relatively late, I should say, to the church. You know, you, we, we had talked about the doctrine of Trinity uh, many hundreds of years earlier and other doctrines of the church. But, so this, this is coming late to the church. Now I want to move to Renaissance humanism, the Renaissance, that rebirth of ideas that had been looking uh, at the classics and rediscovering the classics and say, uh, saying, we need to get back to that source. Now, that Renaissance humanism was religious in nature because all of those that were involved in it, or just about all of them, were professing Christians. Uh, it was a reaction to medieval scholasticism that had seen uh, the the authorities. You know, when when you would engage in in medieval scholasticism, you would gather all the authorities that had written on a particular topic, and you would pit them one against the other to see how uh, how they. Uh, they filled in and answered the questions, uh, sometimes in seeming contradic- contradictual, uh, contradicting ways. But this was a reaction now to go, instead of to those, those uh, scholars, to go back to the source from which their scholarship had been derived. And so it was a desire to return to the Greek and the Latin classics, and even, we're going to see, even when it comes to the Bible, even to the biblical 
you know, you say biblical classics, the original uh, biblical writings, the Greek and the Hebrew. We're going to see how that plays into it. Um, now, the Renaissance writers viewed the more recent times as the Dark Ages. Uh, people that were in the quote-unquote Dark Ages never thought of it as dark, but uh, the Renaissance writers uh, looked at the more recent times. Well, they were in the Dark Ages, but if we could go back earlier, then there was a great deal of light. And, of course, they were talking about the, the Greek and Latin classics. So this desire to re return to the original manuscripts of Plato, of Aristotle, to read them in the Greek. And we're going to see how this carries on the same idea. Let's also go back to the, the, the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament. Let's read those in their original manuscripts as well. Renaissance humanism was a study of the humanities, that is, human endeavors in the realm of literature and rhetoric and poetry and philosophy, art, history, all of these that were endeavors that mankind had brought about. Now, I want to contrast medieval scholasticism with Renaissance humanism. In scholasticism, man is whatever God has made him, just, just accept it. Um, you know, God created us. Uh, he, he is He is what he is. We can search to look and see what that means. In Renaissance humanism, the idea is now being presented that, God, that man can be whatever he decides to be. That man is the master of his fate. In medieval scholasticism, we had very stylized art, and, and Jesus tends to be pictured the same way, and Mary tends to be pictured the same way. In Renaissance human, humanism, we're going to see perspective in art. Some of that will look a little stylized at first, but when you look at the background of the painting, you're going to be able to see things in the distance versus things up close. That's perspective. In scholasticism, we learn by studying God. In Renaissance humanism, we learn by studying creation. But remember, it's creation. It's, it's God's creation. So this, it's not a denial of that, but it's a different perspective, a different focus. In medieval, medieval scholasticism, we study the, uh, the church fathers. In Renaissance humanism, we study the Greek and Roman classics. In medieval scholasticism, it's all about obeying authority. In Renaissance humanism, there's a tendency to question authority. Now, again, this is going to take the form of religious humanism because there's this emphasis we've already talked about in returning to the sources. And for the Christian, um, the Bible, that's going to be the Greek New Testament, the the uh, Sometimes the, <laughs> the Greek translation of the Old Testament, but eventually we're going to see people returning to the Hebrew Old Testament as well. They saw the older church fathers now as better than newer theologians like Aquinas. So you look at Aquinas and you go back perhaps to Augustine, uh, who was much, much earlier. Uh, they admired the classical writers like Plato and Aristotle, even though they had been pagans. It was sometimes viewed, but maybe they had a little bit of the truth. The, so we could call them perhaps, and I'm not sure I would go this far, but they were saying perhaps we could call them pre-Christians. They were about to believe, but they hadn't heard about Jesus yet. Uh, and so they would read the Bible through the eyes of the classics. They noted, for example, in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word, word there, uh, the Greek word logos, is a term that Plato uses to describe uh, the supreme uh, sort of thing that, that puts the universe in order. And they were saying, see, Plato got it. Plato understood. And uh, this is a view that takes a very high view of mankind um, because he's made in the image of God. And, and to a point, I think there, there, there's, there's correction now. Now, I think man is a fallen image. Uh, I think there are some issues with that as well. The premier religious humanism was Dirtius Erasmus. Uh, he was the illegitimate son of a priest. Uh, his parents had died of the plague early on. And so in 1492, the same year that Columbus was discovering America, Erasmus entered the priesthood. He studied Latin and Greek. He never did take Hebrew. Uh, but he is going to become a humanist and taught at Cambridge uh, in, in England. 
1509, he visited Rome. It's interesting to look at the the life and and life flow of Erasmus and then compare it to Martin Luther, who, by the way, also studied uh, Latin and Greek. Eventually, he did Hebrew as well. Um, who also was a professor, who also visited Rome. Um, it's, it's interesting how alike these two men were. In 1511, Erasmus published In Praise of Folly. It, it's a satire, and it's, uh, it talks about church superstition. Uh, it's dedicated to Sir Thomas More, uh, the future Lord Chancellor of England, and there's a play on his on his uh, name, uh, because uh, the term uh, more, more or more is the Latin word folly. So in praise of more, because remember it's, it's written in Latin, uh, it's dedicated and plays with his name uh, and yet deals with looking at, at the superstition that had grown up around the church. So it's a, it's a bit critical in a satirical way of the church. He says, uh, almost all Christians being wretchedly enslaved to blindness and ignorance, which the priests are so far from preventing or removing that they blacken the darkness and promote delusions. Wisely foreseeing that the people, like cows, which never give down their milk so well as when they are gently stroked, would part with less if they knew more. Now, he also writes uh, Education of a Christian Prince. Remember how Machiavelli had written uh, the book The Prince, uh, and Machiavelli had said, you know, for a prince to be successful, he has to lie and cheat and steal and, and never tell the truth and, and, and do all these bad things, and then he'll be a successful prince. Well, um, he's writing this as a rebuttal to Machiavelli's prince, and he says, you know, it's better for a prince to be loved than it is to be feared and that he can accomplish more by motiva- motivating his people as he serves them, as he loves them, and as they love him. He calls them for a rise in general education, that, that the more educated people are, the better citizens they will be, and the more productive they will be, and the happier they will be. He also writes a satire entitled Julius Excluded from Heaven. The Julius in in the title is actually Pope Julius. And in the story, he dies and he goes to heaven and he gets there and St. Peter turns him away. Uh, After all, Julius has not acted like a Christian. Here he is, he's the Pope, but he's acted in a very non-Christian way. And Uh, Pope Julius says, well, who do you think you are to deny me? You're just a fisherman. I am the Pope. I am am governor of the papal territories and and over all of the church. And so Julius plans on making his own heaven. I don't need Peter. I don't need heaven. I'll do things on my own. Now, in 1516, and this is just the year before the Reformation, Erasmus publishes a Greek New Testament with a Latin translation. This is the first Greek New Testament that had been published since the adventing of the printing press. There was actually a race on, there was some folks in Spain that were trying to publish uh, a Greek New Testament as well. And so it was up in the air, who would do it faster? Uh, Frankly, Erasmus rushed through to to win the race. Uh, And so his first edition uh, did have some errors in it. Uh, Now the Latin translation because he added his own his own Latin translation that differed in places from the from the Vulgate. Uh, for example, it says uh, instead of do penance, do penance, uh, Matthew chapter three verse two, which is what the Latin Vulgate said, uh, said be turned to me. You know, we we would just uh, translate that repent, um, turn uh, turn back to me, be turned to me. Um, now it did not include First John chapter five and verse seven. Now that's a a, a, an interesting passage. It's a passage that talks about um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And it's a doctrine that upholds the Trinity. It's a verse that upholds the Trinity. Um, and you say, well, why did not Erasmus put this in his Greek text? It's because it was not in the Greek text, the Greek manuscripts that he had. And so he did not include it. 
uh, in his first two editions. And um, also, when he came down to the the last few verses, the last six verses of the book of Revelation, he all of he had about five or six different Greek manuscripts, and they had different portions of the New Testament, but none of them had those last six verses of the book of Revelation. Um, and so he came down to that, and he didn't he, you know, he knew he knew it was part of the Bible, but the, apparently the last you know sometimes you get a very old book and and the last page might actually fall out, and this is what had happened here. So he pulled out his Latin Vulgate. And he translated from the Latin back into Greek to put these last six verses into his Greek New Testament. And in doing so, an error might have actually uh, uh, crept into the text. Um, not intentionally. He was, trying to, he was trying to be faithful to it. But uh, it's, it's rather laughable because the place where the error is is in that place where it says, uh, let no one add or subtract. That's the verse that got somehow changed a little bit. Uh, let no one add or, or, or subtract. And if anyone does, may his name be taken from the, and here's the change, the book of life versus the tree of life. Now, it's, no matter what you do, it's a bad thing. But that was an interesting place to, uh, of all places to, to let an error creep into the text. Um, now, he eventually is going to come out with five editions uh, because the first edition and, and even the second are sold out very quickly. He says, but the one thing, the facts cry out, and it can be clear, as they say, even to a blind man, that often through the translator's clumsiness or inattention, the Greek has been wrongly rendered. That is, uh, when he's looking at translations, and he's, I think he's specifically talking about Jerome's translations uh, from, the, from the New Testament and even the Old Testament into Latin, into the Latin Vulgate. There have been, there have been some errors in translation. Often the true and genuine reading has been corrupted by ignorant scribes, which we see happen every day, or altered by scribes who are half taught and half asleep. You know, sometimes the the kinds of mistakes that that had entered into a text had been where somebody wasn't paying attention, uh, misspelled a word, or actually, you know, sometimes you have two words that that are written very much alike, but they both make sense, or sometimes one doesn't. And so he's he's talking about these kinds of mistakes that, is, that had crept into the, into the text. With regard to the church, and we'll, we'll close here, Erasmus says, I put up with this church, and he's talking about some, he's written about some of the problems in the church, problems with the Pope. He says, I put up with this church in the hope that one day it will become better, just as it is constrained to put up with me in the hope that I will become better. I love those words. It has been said that Erasmus, and actually it was said back in his day, uh, some monks accused uh, Erasmus. He said, Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched, to which Erasmus replied, you know, I expected quite another type of bird. He wanted a change. He didn't necessarily want Luther's change, but that is exactly what the church received.